what we did uh, earlier, and I think I'd repeat, is introductions by the candidates. And then um, we have a selection of questions. Um, and there's one, since Mr. Gartner is um, by, your, by yourself. I'm by myself. Um, what uh, I'd like to do, if it's okay with you, is if you want to jump in on any of the questions we have for the Senate race, since the, uh, it's, I mean, it's the House, that, you know, it's the yeah. same level of government. Um, any bills have to go through both sides, the, you know, the state legislature. If you want to jump in um, and weigh in, you know, I don't know if you've gotten those questions in advance or not, so I don't put you at a disadvantage. Um, but uh, feel free to jump in because you do have some input on the proposed legislation um, in the state house. Uh, we've got Vicki Schmidt running for state senate, and she's a Republican. She's running for re-election. Um, Dr. Candace Ayers, am I pronouncing that correctly? correct. Yeah. Dr. Candace Ayers, and she's a Democrat running against Ms. Schmidt for the 20th Senate District. And this is where Topeka West sits. We're in the middle of that district. And Mr. Jim Gartner is running for the state house. And he um, has been appointed to replace uh, Annie Teets, who resigned from office. She was a Democrat, and she's, he's serving this particular piece of Topeka, which Topeka West sits on. And it's his um, first campaign, first election, but he is running for re-election because he was appointed to serve during this special session. Am I getting this right? Correct me if I'm wrong. No. Yeah, it's my job to get it right. You know, I'm a government teacher. Right on. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, it's my job. Um, so, um, uh, coin toss, right to left, left to right, ABC order, how, you introduce yourself. How do you want to do this? I'll, I'll start. Okay, all right. I'll just start. Okay, introduce yourselves. And then on the questions, we ran into a time crunch. So, um, if you just be aware of the clock in front of you, be aware, you know, just have a ready chance and move through the questions as soon as possible. Oh, we have some um, latecomers here. Um, oh, okay. They're all in my class. I put a note on the classroom. I put a note on <laughs> online. <laughs> so I don't know why. The door was open. Yeah, yeah, so we didn't see the note. Okay, but there's something on the classroom, wasn't there? All right. Um, anyway, so yeah, some stragglers of mine. All right, fill in, fill in seats. All right, so, uh, Mr. Gartner, you would. Mr. Gartner, good morning. Jim, I'm sorry, Jim. Yeah, call me Jim, yes. Uh, good morning. Uh, good to be here. I am Jim Gartner. I was uh, uh, born here in Topeka, raised, uh, worked for Southwestern Bell, AT&T, retired, and uh, decided I wanted to uh, get involved in politics. And so when Annie Teets resigned earlier this year, I was appointed and in June. And I did spend two days at the Capitol during the special session to take care of an equity problem we had for school funding. And we did take care of that. Um, I'm looking forward to, uh, to running. Uh, also, just FYI, I'm going to throw it out there. Uh, I've been on the Auburn Washburn School Board for eight and a half years, been president three years. So I, I know a little bit about education. Can I interrupt you? Do, are, do you need, um, are you going to be able to keep that position on the school board? Yes. Or, okay. I didn't know if there was There's a conflict, no conflict of interest. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you. I'm Dr. Candace Ayers. Oh, are you going to? Yes, I'm done. <laughs> I'm Dr. Candace Ayers, and I have a PhD in public health. I currently teach at an osteopathic medical college. It's the oldest one in the country. I teach health education to doctoral level students. And I also am a public health practitioner. I used to be the tobacco use prevention director for the state at the time that we implemented the Indoor Clean Air Act. And as part of my work as a public health practitioner, I, I'm an evaluator. And what that means is that I have learned or I'm trained to link outcomes and objectives and accountability and performance. So just that skill alone, I think, qualifies me to be a state senator. And I'm looking forward. I'm, I have had a great time knocking on doors and meeting people as I've been out. And I'm looking forward to talking to you today. My name is Vicki Schmidt. 
First of all, thank you very much for having us all here today. Uh, you have a great government teacher in Ms. Jacobson. She is uh, very uh, attuned to what goes on at the State House and, and uh, brings students down to the Capitol and, and lets you kind of see government in action. I think that's very important, and I hope you don't forget uh, the lessons learned by that. The most important thing I think she does is that uh, encourages you, maybe almost demands, that if you're 18 or older that you're registered to vote. And uh, tr I think she tries to help, uh, I know she tries to help you see the importance of having your voice heard. And I too believe that that's very, very important. I've uh, been your state senator for 12 years and I'm currently up for re-election. I uh, survived a pretty brutal primary and uh, um, you know, that's, um, that's just the way it goes. I'm glad to be on this side of it. Uh, and now I have Dr. Candace Ayers as an opponent and a uh, uh, very nice person and I uh, have enjoyed, uh, enjoyed the race with her. I think it's good to uh, have us both out for forums like this. I am a practicing pharmacist. In fact, I'm going to work as soon as I leave here. I've got my white jacket in the car and I'll switch it out and I'll go count poor lick and stick as they say. Um, so I still practice my trade as a pharmacist. I, I um, have enjoyed doing that. I think that makes me um, a really good, uh, a, have a better handle on things, being a, a uh, practicing pharmacist, being able to talk to people every day about the struggles and, and uh, um, the things that, that are important to them. Um, I uh, am a mother of two grown sons. Uh, we have two grown sons and we just added a second grandson, so I'm pretty excited about that. I'm not going to lie, being a grandmother is my favorite title ever, and because uh, uh, it's so much fun to spoil them and send it home. Um, we have a lot of problems here in Kansas right now. Um, I don't think that's any, uh, it's not a news flash to you, if, if, unless you've been living underneath the rock, you know uh, that we've had some pretty significant budget issues and yesterday didn't bring any good news to the state of Kansas either. So it's going to be a lot of work, but um, we need to change some things up and uh, I'd like to be part of that change. Right. Feel free to stand up and move around. This, oh, okay. you know, this is your, this is your building too, <laughs> you know, public school. Um, so, how do you, Mr. Gartner, do you want to want to go first? Uh, the students came up with a question for you. Um, they, I asked my students to look at all your websites to get to know a little bit, and it says um, on your website you mention only three topics under your issues column: budget right. structure, education, and safety. And what other issues? Um, immigration, agriculture, Second Amendment. And what are your concerns on any additional issues that may come up in the state of Kansas? Well, I think some of those questions are going to be asked to. Uh, Senator Smith and Dr. Ayers, so I will chime in there at the appropriate time. But what, what I might do is just, I can talk a little bit about immigration, agriculture, and Second Amendment. Uh, probably not a lot, only because, you know, in all, all three of those, basically, the federal government uh, really uh, sort of sets the tone and uh, they pass the laws and the states have to uh, abide by those because it's called preemption. We have to abide by whatever the feds pass. But there are some things in particular that affect uh, the state of Kansas. For example, immigration very, very quickly. Our governor has said that he's not going to allow any uh, immigrants into the state. Uh, Syrian refugees or any refugees, I guess, at this point, uh, I don't totally agree with that. Uh, I think uh, refugees are vetted very thoroughly. Uh, I believe the last I heard it's a two-year process and uh, I don't agree with that and I think if uh, the state of Kansas should welcome some of those uh, refugees into the state of Kansas. Uh, agriculture, I'll just move very quickly to that. You know, agriculture is really a demand and supply issue. Uh, prices go up and down, fluctuates. You look in the paper every day. Uh, the price of corn is way down. Price of soybeans is way down. Pork's down. Cattle's down. Everything's down. And a lot of that is based upon demand and supply. There are things we can do in the state of Kansas, and the state of Kansas has done some some really uh, great things over the last few years, and. I'd like to see those continue. For example, 
uh, if you're a farmer, you pay no sales tax on on uh, on the equipment you purchase. That was an incentive that was passed many years ago, and they've taken full advantage of that particular incentive. Uh, this, the second thing is promoting our ag goods, agricultural goods, and uh, you'll see every once in a while the the governor or the ag secretary will make. Uh, they'll go overseas or they'll have summits here in the state of Kansas inviting in the Japanese or other foreign countries to sell our products. And I think that's a very good thing that we need to continue to do that. Uh, last but not least is Second Amendment rights. Uh, that has been a big issue. Uh, we've heard all about it on the national level. Uh, we in the state of Kansas have done some things to uh, open up. Number one, I support Second Amendment rights. I think we all do. Everybody uh, has right to, to bear arms. That's what the Second Amendment is all about. But on the other hand, I'm not sure it makes it safe to, to allow to have uh, guns uh, in, that are used in war uh, being sold and being distributed throughout uh, the United States. So I would, uh, I would oppose that issue. But there are some other things that state can do. For example, a couple years ago they passed a, a law, expanded law, passed a new law that basically says everybody can carry a gun now in Kansas. It's called open carry. Uh, where they used to have concealment carry, where you had to go through training, get a license, uh, now, anybody can carry a gun. I prefer the conceal and carry where everybody has to go through some kind of training because I want them to know how to use that gun, not just have a gun. I think more people could be in jeopardy by those individuals than otherwise. Uh, the last thing I'll say about the uh, Second Amendment, and I had, uh, had a thought, and it sort of uh, screwed it out of my brain very quickly, but. It all boils back to uh, uh, we have a, a really tough decision to make this legislative session, and that is, do we allow students to carry guns on college campuses? That goes into effect, correct me, Senator Smith, but I think July 1st, 2017, unless we repeal that statute. And I am totally, totally against allowing college students to, to carry guns on campuses. And uh, I think we're in big trouble if we allow that to go forward. Uh, not that I don't love and trust young college students, I do. But uh, I think that's just uh, a, a remedy for disaster if we, we allow that to happen. So. Question, Mr. Gardner, do you see yes. that very likely coming up? Do you see that likely coming up oh, this yes. next session? Yes. You need to know my oldest child is a freshman at K-State. And I am full agreement with you. I just think it's a bad mix. It is. It's a terrible mix. So uh, those are <coughs> sort of my three quick issues. Um, Dr. Ayers, Senator Schmidt, do you want to chime in with Mr. Gartner on those issues, or do you want to move on to your questions as well? Well, actually, I would like to comment about Second Amendment issues that, sure. as a faculty member myself, I have to agree with Jim that I am, an, uh, well, and also known to be a hard grader. I am totally against having guns being carried on campus. I think that that is a, is a huge safety issue, and I think that um, our that we go to college to learn. That's why we're there, and that guns have no place in that environment. There are probably a couple of places where guns don't belong, and that's one of them. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, to be clear, we're talking about on campus, residence halls, classrooms, the library, etc. If you live off campus in a rented apartment or house or whatever, that's not part of the law. And that's not addressed. Am I, am I right with that? That's so right. you can own and possess a firearm just when you cross the street and go on campus, you need to leave it at home. And that's, and that's the concern. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm going to make that clear to you guys. Make sure you know that. In that same uh, law that was passed that I did not support, the same law that was passed, it also included public libraries. It included um, hospitals like KU Hospital. Uh, think of um, 
high tension <coughs> events that occur at a hospital, uh, things like that. So I, I uh, we have revisited it every year since it was passed, but we've never um, had enough uh, votes to overturn it. Um, it does state that if you have metal detectors at every entrance to every building, you you can disallow uh, carry, but uh, the cost to the University of Kansas, K-State, Wichita State, and Korea, I mean, think of all those schools, the cost to putting uh, security guards and uh, devices to detect uh, are just too overwhelming to them. So I, I it, since it is a, uh, since the law does not go into effect until July 1st of 2017, um, I don't think we've really heard all, all, everything from the public as of yet. But I think um, we might hear from some concerned parents. Your parents, um, you're going to any of these schools. It's your, it's your, it's you too as well. So think about that. I, I know it's had a, it, in Texas it went into effect this July, um, and the state of Texas. And uh, I know that the, uh, uh, that they've had some resignations um, of very um, influential faculty members. Uh, they've also had instructions on how to conduct, uh, when, when I was in college, which I know was in the dark ages, I get that, but when I was in college, you could, uh, our, our professors had uh, office hours, like maybe from one to four in the afternoon, and you could just bop in if you, if you had a question about, you know, pharmacology or whatever, you could just go in and see the professor, and, and I think some of those uh, habits will be changing uh, if, if the law is um, not changed. Uh, okay, uh, back to all of your questions um, for uh, Dr. Ayers and Senator Schmidt. Um, we have one for Dr. Ayers. Um, what are your plans for ensuring that Kansas students receive a quality education? Okay, I think that uh, to address this adequately, it needs a three-pronged approach. And the first thing that we absolutely have to do is ensure that the revenue is there to fund a quality education. And currently, as Senator Schmidt alluded to, we, we have lots of problems with our budget, and the news this week wasn't any better. And we, we continue to have uh, budget shortages, and this jeopardizes our ability to fund education. So the first thing we need to do is revisit that tax policy that allows businesses not to pay their fair share of taxes. My husband is a businessman who takes advantage of that, and I can tell you from his experience that there is not enough savings to most small businesses from that law to allow them to create a job that pays enough that anyone would want to take it. So what drives business is not tax credits, what drives business is demand. If there is no demand for that job, for an extra person to be there, then a businessman is not going to create that job. So it hasn't brought the revenue to the state that was promised to us. But instead, what it has done is put us into such a budget crisis that we're continuing to get credit downgrades. So the first thing to do is to go and reverse that. Now, I have to be honest with you and tell you that that law was enacted four years ago, and we're just now beginning to feel the effects of it because there's always a lag time you, and you know yourself that when your parents pay taxes, they're always a year behind the, the year before. So what will happen in this case is even if we were able to repeal that law immediately, we would not see any revenue from that for two years. That's really scary because that means the budget deficits will continue unless we find additional sources of revenue. One of the places to find that, those additional sources is, first of all, to stop refusing federal grants that belong to Kansas. Kansas taxpayers have paid for those grants, and we need to bring those into the state. And we've seen our governor continually refuse to accept that federal money. So that's one place where we can get revenue in the meantime. There are others that we're looking at, but that, that's actually a substantial one. The second thing that we need to do to help ensure that students get a quality education is to have a stable funding formula. 
Currently, we're using block grants, and I know that here at school you probably heard your teachers, your parents, even yourselves understand that those are not adequate to equitably and adequately fund your education. So we need to go back to the original formula that we had. Now, that formula has been cr often criticized because it, it's complicated. But I can tell you that your principal and your administrators and your superintendent understand that funding education is a complex process. Therefore, it requires a complex formula. Is this formula too hard to understand? No, it's not. But just in case, I have a PhD, so if we need it, I can understand it. But we, uh, we, need, <laughs> we need to go back to that formula, and if we were to fully fund that formula, we would have the money that's, that you need for a quality education. And that formula takes into account many things. It takes into account not only how many students you have, but also your transportation needs for your buses, how many students that you have uh, that, that speak a second language. It, it is extremely comprehensive. I would rather use that word than complicated in, in addressing what schools need to have adequate funding to ensure that you get a quality education. And the third thing that we need to address to make sure that you have a quality education is that we need to look and restore due process to your teachers. Probably every one of you sitting in this room have a teacher that you remember on some occasion that has been instrumental in your life. Whether that teacher has helped you over a difficult patch in your personal life or whether they've helped you with, with uh, difficult concepts that you've had trouble understanding or whether they've just been there to listen to you. You know how valuable your teachers are. <clears throat> and if they do not have due process, they don't have job security, which means that they are likely to leave. Not only leave your school, but leave the state to go to other places where they have uh, better benefits and where our population honors them. So if it were up to me, those are the three things that I would say we need to, for you to be able to have a quality education here in Kansas. Sure. Well, I'll talk a little bit about, I did not support the block grants um, because that, that was not a good solution to a problem we were having. Block grants uh, have created a lot of havoc in the schools. The block grant meant that you, your school gets the same amount of money for two years that they got the previous, the, the first year, or the, the year it was instituted. That didn't make any sense. If your population increases, then, then you didn't have enough money to educate all the students. If your population decreased, if the amount of students coming to your school decreased, then you actually got more money for, for less students. None of that made any sense. Um, Dr. Ayers is right in that the formula is, um, I can't remember which word was, complicated or uh, complex, complex. Um, and, and, and it is, but um, you can sit down and, and you can reason through it. It's a formula that's been in existence for many, many years, but it's like Social Security. When Social Security was instituted, it looked a lot different than it is today because you make changes as, as, the, as your needs change and as, as the environment changes. You know, the education process has changed immensely since I was in school or even since our sons were in school. And so the, the, the uh, formula was designed to, to change with changing needs. But one of the biggest problems is that it was never fully funded. And without a fully funded education formula, then you, then you receive these little holes that, that we received. But the block grant was not an answer. Unfortunately, the block grant, when it was passed, um, the governor signed it into law, obviously, and, and we're underneath it now. But I do believe the original plan, um, even for those of us who didn't vote for it, w was that it would uh, we would start working on a new formula immediately to replace it because you're not going to replace a 40-year-old formula overnight. But that is now the situation we find ourselves in. I served on the Education Committee for the last four years. Do you know how many days we spend in hearings on what the formula looks like and what, what proposals might come forward um, for the new formula? Absolutely none. No days were spent on that. 
that that is that is not acceptable on on any um, on any level. Um, so now we find ourselves at the end of block grants at the end of this year, and uh, I'd like to know who's working on the formula. Uh, I have some ideas about it, but um, you know it's going to take more than one person to. Well, I hope it takes more than one person to do that formula. So that that's that is that is a very big problem. Um, and and your education, I mean, without without educating our students, what do we have? I mean, education drives so much of our society. And I want you to be educated. I want you to be able to be working when I'm in the nursing home so that I can stay there. Um, that was a joke. <laughs> I know. Wake up. Woo! <laughs> no. Uh, anyway, I, I, so, it, you know, I mean, we, we need an educated workforce. We need people to have an education. And it not only pertains, the education issue is not only with K through 12, but the education is preschool. Our preschool programs have been hurt drastically. And then regions and our, our higher education. Um, you're all seniors, is that, is that correct, if you're in government class? So, you know, what, what lays before you um, are increased in tuition. Uh, tuition rates have gone up dramatically, and I would estimate that they will continue to go up. And I don't want to see you priced out of an education. I'm a, I'm a first generation college graduate in my family. Um, I, uh, I, I went to a public schools in Wichita. I grew up in Wichita, and you know, it, without uh, my college education, I wouldn't be here today standing before you. So education is important, whether whatever that is for you post-secondary. It doesn't have to be college, but still a trade or something. So anyway, it's important, and we need to fund it. Anything else? Thank you so much. All right. Um, next on our list um, was uh, for Senator Schmidt, how do you create a stable and balanced budget in Kansas? I noticed you gave me the easy question. <laughs> so Sorry, thank you so much, Ms. Jacobson. So, um, well, that's going to be a real, a real uh, trick. Um, we are down about, I don't know, 60, 70 million dollars in the first quarter of this year. Um, you know, it, I, I imagine that it's like uh, sitting around if your uh, parents are sitting around the table and they've uh, come up a little short in the, in the, um, uh, in the budget for the month. Uh, this is the way the state of Kansas is currently handling it. Oh, gee, I've got a MasterCard bill and it's X amount of money. And the, next, the, the other person says, well, here's the Visa card. Why don't we use the Visa card to pay off the MasterCard? And then I can still keep charging on my American Express. That's how the state of Kansas is functioning right now. It's non-sustainable. It cannot work. We really need real revenue reform. But we need a fair and balanced tax system and we don't have that right now it's already been pointed out to you that there are about 338,000 businesses that aren't paying any Kansas state income tax that's a um, that's about a 1 billion with a B that's a lot of zeros um, I go home and ask my husband what's wrong with my checkbook there's not enough zeros in it but um, that's a big problem for Kansas. So, you know, we're going to have to sit down and we're going to have to start back from ground zero. And we cannot, but you cannot continue to function in a deficit. States cannot declare bankruptcy, I don't believe. None have. So, where, you know, we have to make some radical adjustments. And the problem is, just as has been pointed out, a tax change does not take place until fiscal year 2018, until the last half of fiscal year 2018. We're currently, it's a little bit confusing, but we're in fiscal year uh, 17 right now, 2017, because the year starts July 1st and, and you name it of the year that you actually end, which is June 30th of 2017. So we're actually in fiscal year 2017. But uh, tax changes are going to, um, rev rev revenue reform has to happen because we cannot continue on this path. We can be mad at the, at the consensus revenue estimators. That's what's big in the paper now about uh, paper and other news media about, about, you know, well, they've missed the estimates. We're in uncharted territory of all the, of, of, of businesses not paying taxes. The uh, nicotine, the tobacco sales tax, I'm sure, I'm sure Dr. Ayers took note of this yesterday, was, uh, was significantly down. Um, I don't know why that, I think it was about 18 million if I'm not mistaken, but I'm not sure why that happened, but you know, 
Um, could it be we're, we're losing uh, sales to the border um, border uh, um, states, it, Missouri, if you live in Kansas, and maybe go to Missouri now uh, to purchase nicotine products to avoid the high sales tax? I mean, I, you know, I, I don't know. But we cannot sustain what we have now, and we have to get back to basics. I mean, we, we've, I've been in state government when we've been back to basics and when we've had a functioning state government and when we've had a 7.5% ending balance. I know what that looks like. I'd give anything to go back to those days now. We don't have that. But we're going to have to get our heads together and get back in in the game. And um, with or without administration or govern, governor support, we have to figure a way to do this. Dr. Ayers, Mr. Gartner, any additional comments on the budget? Well, I will say that one of the reasons that tobacco revenues is down is not necessarily that people are going across the border, but they've just shifted to another source, which is vaping. And so they're buying, they're, they're not buying as much tobacco as they are just the liquid nicotine for vaping. And as, as a prevention specialist, I would like to hope that the increase in the tobacco tax has caused them to quit. Okay, and because that's what it's designed to do. We always, as, as tobacco prevention um, people, we've all, we always push the increase in tobacco taxes as a way to spur cessation. And I'm sure that that has happened. Um, I also think that, that this last uh, session, there was not an increase in alcohol tax, and that's likely going to be another source of revenue, is to increase those consumption taxes, which is unfortunate, but uh, will prob probably and likely happen. Just one quick, uh, I agree with, with what uh, Vicki said and Dr. Ayers. Uh, it, is, it is a uh, revenue reform problem. We need to look at our total tax structure, as Senator Smith said. Uh, you know, this, the, the governor promoted this uh, tax issue, reduction in taxes for LLCs and sole proprietorships in 2012 to spur job growth. Uh, we haven't seen the job growth, and I would argue a better investment for that money are you. Uh, to you, for your education, I can guarantee you if uh, we had a fully funded education funding formula like we talked about earlier that uh, uh, we would get much, much more uh, dividends uh, from you all uh, in your education than this little uh, no money that we've seen in reduction in the uh, tax issue. Thank you. Are you guys surprised at how much agreement is going on right now? Yes. yes. Okay. What? Yeah. How about that? Isn't that cool? Um, if, if, there's more agreement than disagreement in government. Um, the next one is for Dr. Ayers. And the student asks, I really like some of your ideas about reasonable access to health care. And the question is, how do you plan to implement those ideas in a way that separates you from Senator Schmidt, who is a pharmacist? Okay, I'm not sure that my ideas would really separate me from Senator Schmidt because there is actually a broad consensus on, uh, on what constitutes reasonable access to health care. And <coughs> The first part of that, there are actually two parts, and the first part of that is the medical home concept. That when people have access to a nurse practitioner, physician's assistant, or a doctor, or other health care provider, they are more healthy. And, and getting them that access is important. So right now it's probably important for you to know that over 90% of the counties in Kansas are listed as health professional shortage areas. And that means either as um, that, that they lack dentists or they lack other health care professionals like doctors, nurses, physicians, assistants. So the one thing that we do need to do is, is implement a plan for filling some of those shortages. So what could that possibly be? Well, one of the things that has been done in other states is to invest in emerging healthcare professionals. These are people who are currently graduating from their, their training as a doctor, or nurse, or physician's assistant, and give them incentives to go to these shortage areas, like tuition reimbursement or forgiveness for a student debt. 
wouldn't this be great for those of you who are considering a career in healthcare that you would know that if you were to go someplace like Colby, Kansas or Parsons and spend a little bit of time there, a few years there, providing health care to that community that you could be debt free for your education. And there are other states that do these, these programs and they're, they're quite successful at helping to fill the shortages. So that, that is the first plan of attack. The second would be to expand can care. This is one of the problems that we have, again, that we've turned away federal money that belongs to Kansas. When you, you give people insurance, they also are able to access health care in a reasonable way. And, this is, and, and we need to do this. We've got a backlog in can care now that needs to be addressed. That's a systems change that we need to work on as an evaluator. I, I understand how to fix systems. It's part of what I do as a professional, not only designing and implementing programs that work, but going in and fixing programs that don't work, like can care. So those are the two approaches that I would take to making sure that Kansas, ha Kansans have uh, reasonable access to health care. Any other comments? Sure. We do have a loan forgiveness program for MDs. Um, in, in fact, you can have your tuition uh, uh, paid, if you will, to serve in an underserved area or to serve in uh, certain areas, and then you can also uh, get a stipend uh, every month in order uh, while you're in medical school if, if you did agree to come back to an underserved area. That's been actually in place since about 1970. 1977-78 and we have expanded that program as the years have gone by but it's usually only good for family practice physicians uh, or, or internal medicine uh, primary care physicians um, we don't we don't do that for gerontologists and we have a huge shortage of gerontologists um, newsflash the baby boomers are aging and and uh, need care and uh, you know, I know, right? And uh, so, anyway, uh, we do we do have a program like that, and we actually have that for uh, believe it or not, for large animals, uh, for veterinar veterinarians that want to do uh, large animals, which I know is not the healthcare we're speaking of, but it is uh, still a, an a, it's still a shortage in our um, in our um, in our state. Um, but I think that you know, so so we we have some experience. We have quite a bit of experience and background in that. Sometimes what we find, though, is that people come out to those, uh, they, they sign up for that and they'll go out to an underserved area and they'll be there until their loan repayment is done and then they leave the community. And the community is no better off than uh, four years later than they were, you know, the previous four, the four years before the, uh, the physician came. So I think that, you know, we, we, we have to work on that and we, we know we have a, a problem with that. But um, it is something that uh, the legislature has considered. But again, that takes money. I mean, that, that takes uh, financial resources uh, to be able to implement that. One thing that I'm really proud of that we did is uh, um, many of you would not know how close we came to not having a medical school uh, here in Kansas in the last couple of years. Our teaching area is very antique. Any of you that are, want to go into medicine or, health, or allied health uh, fields would uh, maybe have researched uh, the University of Kansas Medical Center uh, KUMC and that we were uh, we needed to upgrade the facility and we needed to um, actually do a whole whole new plan and uh, a couple of years ago we were able to secure some uh, bonding for the uh, KUMC to ensure that we have a medical school. I can't imagine living in a state, we only have one medical school in our state. I can't imagine living in a state without um, medical students graduating. It's bad enough not having a dental school. A dental school would, has about a 43, 45 million dollar price tag on it. We have huge dental dentist shortage also here in Kansas. So all those things need to be uh, looked at. But workforce development is definitely a part of healthcare access. Very good. Uh, next question is um, for Senator Schmidt, and it's from a mother of a student. <laughs> and they're asking, and um, Dr. Ayers may have some input on this as well. What's your stance on the mandatory Gardasil vaccine? It's it's actually Gardasil. Gardasil. That's what I thought. Mm -hmm. Okay, Gardasil vaccine. I'm I'm going to assume it's Gardasil. Uh, uh, the HPV. So I actually wrote some notes down because I didn't want to mislead you. 
um, on uh, things. I believe that there are three jurisdictions uh, right now that require mandatory um, HPV for school attendance, Rhode Island, Virginia, and uh, District of Columbia. Um, there are uh, 42 states that have introduced or uh, to require, fund, or educate uh, public or school children about uh, HPV. We've actually had some introduction of laws in Kansas since I've been in the legislature about mandatory vaccination of HPV. I don't think mandatory vaccination of HPV is uh, the way I would go, but I'd love to have mandatory education about HPV. And it's a constantly changing, I mean, we now have, um, it used to be that it was with four, uh, it protected against four different kinds of HPV, six, 11, uh, 16 and 18, and now that Gardasil actually has come out with Gardasil 9. Um, you all know what I'm talking about, right? Okay, okay. If you don't, let me know. But, um, you know, it, it does require three shots. It's original shot, and then um, one to two months later, the second shot, and then six months after the first <coughs> shot, the third shot. But we do know that even with a single vaccination, uh, you're, you're much more protected. There's some very interesting research out right now. We uh, think about sexually transmitted diseases when we talk about HPV, but there's some um, interesting um, research being done on the prevention of uh, uh, thyroid cancer with the administration of HPV and for some reason and I, I don't know um, I've not read definitive studies on why this is but uh, thyroid cancer in, in uh, young adults is increasing at an alarming rate and um, so some of that research is uh, hot off the press and and uh, I look forward to following that research but uh, I do believe that uh, we need to uh, educate both you and your parents at, at 11 years of age when when the uh, uh, is the earliest that we recommend uh, that's recommended by the CDC to receive the vaccination uh, 11 year olds might not be able to make a decision on their own about that but uh, obviously individuals your age are very capable of making uh, decisions about that and uh, so I would not mandate it but I think that uh, education is a is a real important part of that and some states have taken care taken advantage of federal dollars that have been awarded to states to help vaccinate uh, their young population um, obviously not on a mandatory basis thank you so to be clear on the question it's not required at this time no not okay. in Kansas okay but it is um, <coughs> healthcare officials offer it as a choice correct sure okay all right Dr. Ayers Mr. Governor Jim well, I would just add to that that I, I agree that for people your age, it should not be mandatory. You, you can certainly make that decision. As a public health professional, I would advise you to be vaccinated, uh, but I, I don't think that we need it to be mandatory because with, uh, with good education, people will either avoid the, uh, the risk or they will also get the vaccination. So I think we can handle that with education. I agree with uh, educating and mandating if, uh, to educate uh, parents and, and children, but not mandating that everyone receive the, uh, uh, the vaccine. Okay. I read in the newspaper this morning, Mr. Gertner, that um, uh, uh, Washburn approved some new materials, just updated yes. materials. The updated. content doesn't change, but they got instead of videotapes, they got DVDs and whatnot. Right. For, um, we still have VHS. <laughs> yes, um, in, in the meeting last night. Um, okay, and then last, but it's, um, our time is, oh, we have a question? Before we move on real quick, uh, just for everyone, with all the health benefits to the entire public from vaccinations and all that, what exactly is the harm in mandating it? Part of that, it, part of that is a, it, it goes into the expense of it and whether or not it's covered by health insurance, uh, whether or not health insurers will uh, cover it. It's a great question. Um, and then I think also um, with every, our vaccine laws in Kansas uh, do, do allow for exceptions, um, parental preference, religious preference, things like that. But what we do know is herd immunity. And, uh, you know, and, and you're probably familiar with community immunity or herd immunity. You know, if, if we get, you know, uh, majority, like 80, 90 percent of people vaccinated, then, then 
we're we're good as a community. And um, um, you know, I mean, how many of you have got your flu shots? Oh yeah, go this get year? Them. already. Oh yeah, wow, yeah. I'm very impressed. Have you not? No, oh, I'm going to take her with me to my work right now and vaccinate her. Uh, um, I, do, I do, just not yet. I know, I saw that article yesterday that said that you should wait. I'm telling you, don't wait. Don't wait. Get it now. But anyway, but yeah, so I think ma mandatory vaccinations have um, have a, uh, ma mandatory things like that have a whole nother, take on a whole nother life. Very good, very good. An excellent question. Um, and as a parent, I think parents like the power to choose, and, and, and if you mandate mandate something, then that takes away choices that parents have. And, and oh, I'm sorry, but sometimes health officials know more about health than parents. Correct. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's and that's the you know that's the juggling act, not the balancing act that we have. So, um, can I say something about that? And that's true. Actually, what Senator Smith is saying about the cost benefit of mandating vaccines is quite real. And when you look at diseases and their prevalence in the population. You don't want to, well, you don't need to mandate a vaccine that, that doesn't reach a critical level of prevalence or also can't be avoided any other way. Okay, so, am, am, you know, am I in favor of mandating things like polio vaccine? Yes, you know, <laughs> those kinds of things, measles. That, that, but um, in something like this where you obviously, <coughs> with education, can avoid the risk, I, I don't see a need to be for it to be mandated. Okay. All right. Uh, are we at the end of our time? We got like. I mean, we have, we have some more time in class, but are we at the end time of our scheduled time with the candidates? Okay. We have one more question, or any closing comments from the candidates? You guys decide. I, I'm well, Mark, you want to see if anybody's got specific questions? questions? <laughs> Um, the majority of you guys are health officials, so uh, I'd, I'd like the uh, <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd like your opinion. But if, if you'd like to chime in as well, it's fine. Um, uh, what is your sort of stance on the uh, ending of the prohibition of uh, marijuana use in the state of Kansas? I'll let Senator Schmidt go first. <laughs> wow. So now I'd like for my closing remarks to happen. That's touchy, isn't it? That's a real touchy thing. Um, we have had bills before us that uh, we had a bill that passed the House last year on uh, medical marijuana, um, on, on, can, on uh, oils uh, for children. Um, but, you know, I think that um, we've not really had full hearings of experts that have come in and talked about pros and cons and about, um, you know, now there are some states that have experience uh, with them, uh, with, with changing the laws. Um, it's not number one on my priority list right now. I think getting the state back into uh, getting our fiscal house in order and, and uh, looking at those types of things and, and getting our revenue systems uh, have to and, and getting an education formula that's fair and responsible all those things have to take precedent over that but uh, I'm not I'm not averse to looking into it but my background as a pharmacist um, might lead me down a different path okay and I, and I will actually tell you that I am in favor of decriminalizing marijuana um, I, I think that um, that we need to do that because we've seen what that's done to people in, a, in you know just socially and with them being able to get jobs and and um, and work and things like that. It's put them in terrible positions that they probably shouldn't have been in just for making one or two mistakes. So decriminalizing it, yes. I have mixed feelings about completely legalizing it. And, and, I, and I will tell you that I've actually looked into it as a way of increasing revenue because it, it yeah. could help yeah. fill those gaps. Right. And I don't think it's completely off the table, but I do think that, that before we do such a thing like that, that we need to not rush into it as perhaps we did with the tax policy and really look at the pros and cons of, of what that would do to our system 
and, and whether the revenue that we could potentially generate from that would, would actually be worth the social costs that we might incur with that. So I guess my uh, stance on that is approach with caution. I'm not a health official, but on this one, uh, I, the, I believe we passed a bill, I believe last year, on uh, decriminalizing marijuana first time offenses, if I remember correctly. And I think we ought to continue to look at that. Uh, medicinal uh, purposes for marijuana use, I want to know more about it. I think that's our next step. I have talked to a number of people. I know Dr. Ayers and, and Vicki, I'm sure they're uh, that, uh, that struggle with uh, either uh, they can't get relief through the different medications, so they they revert to uh, marijuana. Uh, so I want more information on that. And then in the meantime, I think we need to continue to look at Colorado and Washington and uh, to see how they're progressing since they have totally legalized marijuana use, and we can evaluate going forward. Right. Well, I will add one more thing to that, too. I have spoken to several researchers who have, who have told me that they would be in favor of legalizing marijuana because one of the reasons, as, uh, as Jim mentioned, that you know we need to know more about it, but one of the reasons we don't know more about it is because it's illegal. And so if we did make it legal, this would open up an avenue for researchers to be able to, to study it in more depth and provide more definitive information <coughs> about whether it really is medicinally useful because there, the jury is still out on that one. Well, I agree with that on one point, but the FDA, I mean, we do have, uh, on Schedule One drugs, there are avenues for researchers to research Schedule One drugs. Yep. And there are also avenues for, for uh, individuals that have a specific need uh, for a specific Scheduled one to have the access to that to that uh, medication uh, to that to that substance and certainly uh, the FDA has opened that up a little bit so so we do have that I mean we we train drug dogs with drugs right and, yeah. and we have I mean we have avenues to do to do to do some of that research now but anyway we'll see any other questions okay. uh, just really quickly I was curious we haven't had a ton of problems here in Kansas as of yet but. You know, both things going on in Charlotte and various cities across the uh, uh, and states across the nation. We've seen a lot of police accountability issues, and I was curious how you would work with law enforcement or, you know, maybe try and inform to make sure that we don't see those issues uh, occurring here in Kansas and see people, you know, maybe being shot for no reason or having no indictments or not being able to really get the full facts of the case. Well, I'll uh, start on that one. Uh, you know, I think every community needs to look internally and uh, evaluate uh, their policing, their community, and uh, I think that's where it starts, to have bring people together uh, in each community. I believe community policing is forefront uh, with that issue. Uh, and number one, I totally believe that training is one of the key issues also. I, I think when you if you read the reports and, and you read about all these instances <coughs> where things have occurred, uh, I think a lot of the uh, police that are involved just don't have the actual background training that they really need to go over and over and over again. So when they're put in that real life situation, instead of pulling a gun, maybe they're supposed to use a stun gun, or their training says, don't shoot to kill, shoot to injure. It, it, to me, this all has to come together in each police force and community to try to move forward and resolve this issue. Well, and, and I have to agree with that as well, that, that it, education and the training is key. Um, I spoke with a police officer who was, he was giving a talk to a group where I attended, and he, he was a trainer for a police force in Wichita. And, and he told me 
that it that most of the public is shocked to learn that when a police officer pulls his gun, his accuracy is less than 20 percent. And so we need to make sure that if they are going to pull a gun, that there's a really good reason for that because the chances that they are going to miss and not you know, the, this accuracy about being able to, to wound them as opposed <coughs> to kill them, it, it isn't there. Their adrenaline is just as high in those situations as everyone else's. And, and when he told us that they have such a low accuracy in terms of when they do pull their gun, then that tells me that what we need is, is education and training to make sure that they do everything else possible before that happens. I'd agree with a lot of what was said. Uh, I, I think education is a, is a big part of that, and, and I do believe that um, both our police chief and our uh, Shawnee County Sheriff uh, are very cognizant of the facts of, of what is what have happened, and they're um, they're taking um, steps to continue down the road that they're on on education and um, making this a safe place for all of us. Um, we only what 16? We only got what a couple three minutes left. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so why why don't we get a couple minutes and shake some hands, introduce the students, you know, work the crowd kind of thing, and when the bell rings, you guys are excused to go on to your next class. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much.